Well, welcome uh, to you all for the uh, annual oration uh, organised by the Victoria Law Foundation. This is an uh, event has been held since 2005, originally as part of Law Week. Uh, it has had in the past and has tonight a uh, stunning uh, series of speakers. Um, my uh, job simply is to get the show on the road. That I'll do shortly. My name is Hartley Hanson. I chair the board of the Victoria Law Foundation. And I have much pleasure in welcoming you to the oration in this most beautiful and historic room. I will shortly uh, invite the Chief Justice, the Honourable Marilyn Warren AC, to open the proceedings, but I should mention a few housekeeping matters. The first is, could you please make sure that your phone is turned off? And if, if you've got the slightest doubt, uh, please uh, check. The second thing is that uh, this event is being recorded uh, with the intention of uh, placing it on the Foundation's website. If you have any concern uh, yourself about uh, uh, that, uh, then speak to a member of staff or re relocate. Um, the, uh, at the conclusion of the oration, uh, there will be 15 minutes uh, in which there can be questions uh, and answers. Uh, His Honour has agreed to um, uh, engage in that process. Uh, I'll just warn you from the outset, uh, you will not have a microphone, so you'll need to speak up firmly and clearly, uh, but there will be 15 minutes for that process. Uh, without uh, further ado, it's my pleasure now, on behalf of the uh, Victoria Law Foundation, to invite the Chief Justice to uh, open the proceedings. Thank you, Chief Justice. Well, Chair of the Victoria Law Foundation, Justice Hanson, President Maxwell, Your Honours, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to see such an interested turnout here this evening. I'm sure you would join with me in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we gather this evening and pay our respects to their elders, past and present, the people of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people. I would want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the enormous public community education role that the Law Foundation plays in this state. This evening, this oration is a traditional event held each year with very, very eminent speakers invited to speak to the legal profession and the judiciary, but also the wider community about topical legal issues. It is my very proud pleasure this evening to introduce, to speak to us, my colleague, the senior puny judge of the Supreme Court of Victoria, Justice Mark Weinberg. His honour was appointed to the Court of Appeal of the Supreme Court eight years ago. In that period, he has sat in all matters, both criminal and civil. He has tended, more often than not, to be typecast as a criminal lawyer, but that for anyone who knows who has appeared before his honour in a civil appeal would know that is a dreadful mistake. His honour, as part of his non-criminal background, was a judge of the Federal Court of Australia for 10 years before joining the Court of Appeal. And during that time, he was also the Chief Justice of Norfolk Island. In addition to his judicial career, his honour has had a very distinguished academic career. He was the Supreme Court Prize winner in his year at Monash University. He then studied for his Bachelor of Civil Law at Oxford. Now, for some of you who are not familiar with the BCL degree at Oxford, what happens is that the best students from all around the world gather at Oxford to study the degree. His honour was the Vinarian Scholar, the top scholar of his year. He subsequently spent 13 years teaching and studying law at the University of New South Wales, Osgoode Hall and the University of Melbourne. He was Dean of Melbourne Law School from 1984 to 1985, one of the predecessors of 
Professor Carolyn Evans, the Dean of Melbourne Law School, who is here this evening. Then there is Justice Weinberg's, uh, what I'll describe as his professional career. He joined the Victorian Bar in 1975. He was appointed one of Her Majesty's Counsel for the State of Victoria 11 years later. He was then the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions for three years. Then he returned to the private bar until his appointment to the federal court. Recently, his honour has been awarded the Inns of Court Fellowship at the University of London, an award that is made to distinguished jurists, and later this year, for three months, his honour will be travelling to, engaging and studying in London, representing this court. Of course, his honour is also well known for his speeches and papers, both nationally and internationally, particular particularly on the criminal law. Now, for those of you who know, this will come as no surprise. For those of you who have not encountered Justice Weinberg before, perhaps I should warn you. His Honour takes an approach which is extremely challenging and questioning. So prepare to be provoked. Prepare to be made to question why things are done a particular way. His Honour's address to us this evening will be wide-ranging, but I note this evening that we have a wide-ranging audience, so how appropriate his remarks will be. I want to give you just a hint of what you should prepare yourself for. If, as lawyers in particular, we reflect on legislation and lawmaking, it lies at the heart of much of what we do as lawyers, judges, legal and public administrators and academics. And as part and parcel of that, new legislation is continuously coming down upon us, disturbing well-settled legal principles. But the question is, is it being done the best way? Let us hear from Justice Weinberg as he challenges <coughs> us on that question and others. Justice Weinberg. Well, thank you, Chief Justice, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I begin by thanking the Victoria Law Foundation for having organised this evening's event. It is an honour to have been invited to speak to you tonight. I am, of course, conscious of the fact that among previous presenters in this series have been a number of great legal luminaries. I have no doubt that some of you have come here this evening for one reason only. That is to see how, if at all, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, perhaps the greatest musical genius of all time, can legitimately be linked to a subject as soporific as modern drafting, still less to a subject as parochial as the ongoing grievances of the criminal bar. There will be cynics among you who believe that I have included Mozart in the title of this paper simply to bolster the attendance tonight. As I hope to demonstrate, you are mistaken. You will have to wait in order to find out why. As the Munchkins said to Dorothy, quote, it is always best to start at the beginning, unquote. In my case, that was as a law student almost exactly 50 years ago. It was then, under the expert guidance of a great teacher, Professor Louis Waller, that I first came across the tragic tale of Messrs Dudley and Stevens and the events surrounding the shipwreck of the yacht Mignonette. Since that time, I have been both intrigued and fascinated by the criminal law. In the 1960s, the criminal law, both in this state and throughout much of the rest of Australia, was largely common law. Many of the most serious offences, murder, manslaughter, rape, as well as assault and larceny, were judge-made. So too were the general defences, such as provocation, self-defence, duress, intoxication and insanity. The same was true of inchoate doctrines such as complicity, attempt, incitement and conspiracy. The rules governing criminal procedure developed largely from court decisions, as did the law of evidence. As for sentencing, it did not exist as a separate body of legal doctrine. Of course, none of that is any longer true. Today, our criminal justice system is basically governed by statute. Putting to one side the bluster of Rumpole and his constant invocation of the golden thread, the criminal law is all about statutory interpretation. 
The shift from common law to statute, and in some cases to codification, is generally regarded as having been both necessary and desirable. Unquestionably, the criminal law as it stood was in dire need of reform. Whereas criminal law, perhaps above all other branches of the law, ought to be created in a systematic and principled manner, it is all too often developed by way of ad hoc response to particular situations which have confronted courts. Fifty years ago, the criminal law had come to be seen as incomprehensible, inconsistent and uncertain. Academic lawyers in particular have long led the push for legislative reform in this area, and they were right to do so. But reform can come at a price. In some respects, that price is continuing to be paid. The case for legislative reform and perhaps ultimately codification is not based upon the misplaced assumption that change of this kind is likely to reduce the incidence of crime. Rather, it is based upon a belief that when reform is carefully implemented, the law can be made more accessible and coherent. It is, of course, possible to achieve these goals through legislation that is well thought out and appropriately drafted. In England, the Theft Act 1968 was a carefully considered mini-codification of almost the entire law relating to property offences. However, even then the courts have encountered difficulty with some of its provisions. The courts in England have also struggled with other legislative reforms. As Professor A.T.H. Smith correctly observed, the extraordinary interpretation given to the Criminal Damage Act 1971 by the House of Lords in the Queen against Caldwell and to the Road Traffic Act 1972 in the Queen against Lawrence would give even the most hardened advocate of codification pause for thought. The same could be said of their Lordship's judgment with regard to the statutory offence of conspiracy under the Criminal Law Act 1977 in the Queen against Ayres and their extraordinary treatment of the offence of attempt under the Criminal Attempts Act 1981 in Anderton and Ryan. As Professor Smith goes on to say, there has long been a movement in favour of codification of the entire criminal law. The aims of any code must be to promote accessibility, comprehensibility, consistency and certainty. A code should digest an entire field of law consisting of decisions and legislation and weld them into a coherent whole. It must aspire to being comprehensive and must envisage that, ultimately at least, common law doctrines will be abolished. A function of a code should be to provide all those who are concerned in some way with the criminal justice system, and that includes those who are subject to that system, with a fixed starting point for ascertaining what the law is. The common law has generally failed in that regard because it did not afford that common base. Even though when a code is enacted there will always be difficulties of interpretation, there will at least be fundamental agreement as to what it is that is being construed. Finally, a criminal code as distinct from an ordinary statute should permit judges and others who have recourse to it to look for and find answers within the four corners of the document itself. In Victoria, we have, in one sense, only just begun the process of codification. Thus far, that process has essentially been confined to criminal procedure and evidence. The Commonwealth, on the other hand, has embraced codification wholeheartedly, but not always, as I hope to demonstrate, to good effect. As regards the substantive law in this state, most serious offences, murder and manslaughter apart, are now governed exclusively by statute. I should at this stage make a disclaimer. Much of my work in the Court of Appeal consists of hearing criminal appeals against both conviction and sentence. That means that I see the criminal law through the prism of legal argument. I recognise that this is a distorted picture because, of course, the vast majority of criminal trials concern facts and the law very much occupies a subsidiary role. Nonetheless, my work on this court means that I am privy in all sorts of ways to the views of those who are forced on occasion to engage with legal issues, practitioners and judges alike. My assessment is that few of my judicial colleagues and even fewer of my friends at the criminal bar would have anything at all good to say about large swathes of our current criminal law. In my opinion, a number of their complaints have substance. The criminal law of today is not the criminal law of the past. It is far more complex and te technically difficult to master. In some respects, and for some judges and practitioners, it has become almost a nightmare. 
In this paper, I will seek to defend four propositions regarding the current state of our criminal law. A. Legislatures, both state and federal, have enacted too many laws. B. A number of those laws are incredibly prolix. C. Some of the provisions contained within those laws are unnecessarily complex, lack coherence, and are far too prescriptive. And D. The laws are too frequently amended. Too many laws. In Victoria today, there are an extraordinary number of statutes that deal in various ways with aspects of our criminal justice system. In the field of substantive law, these include the Crimes Act 1958, the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act 1981, and the Jury Directions Act 2015. With regard to criminal procedure, they include the Criminal Procedure Act 2009, the Crimes Mental Impairment Unfitness to be Tried Act 1997, and the Bail Act 1977. The law of evidence is now essentially codified by the Evidence Act 2008. Finally, sentencing is encompassed within the Sentencing Act 1991 and, to some degree, within the Confiscation Act 1997. There are numerous other state acts that create criminal offences of various kinds, as well as regulating the investigation and prosecution of these matters. See, for example, the Children, Youth and Families Act 2005, the Corrections Act 1986, the Firearms Act 1996, the Occupational Health and Safety Act 2004, the Road Safety Act 1986, and the Serious Sex Offenders Detention and Supervision Act 2009. Almost 30 years ago, I wrote the foreword to the first textbook on Commonwealth criminal law published in this country. It was a relatively short book, encompassing within some 300 pages virtually all aspects of substantive law, procedure and sentencing. A book of that length can still be written today, but it has become almost impossible to deal within it with the entire body of federal criminal law. Over the past 20 years, there has been an explosion of Commonwealth criminal law. It now encompasses inter alia such areas as bribery of foreign public officials, people smuggling, both in its simple and aggravated forms, terrorism, offences against humanity and related crimes, slavery, trafficking in persons, child sex offences outside Australia, trafficking, controlled drugs and precursors, identity crime, money laundering, telecommunications offences and computer offences. Unlike Victoria, the Commonwealth has essentially dealt with the bulk of criminal offences within a single statute, which represents at the same time a complete codification of the law. I refer in that regard to the Criminal Code Act 1995, which I shall describe as the Code. The Crimes Act 1914 deals with police powers of investigation and also contains within it Part 1b, the sentencing regime that operates in relation to all Commonwealth offences. In addition, the Commonwealth has its own statute dealing with confiscation of assets, the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. Now, anyone charged with a Commonwealth offence will be tried in a state court exercising federal jurisdiction. Accordingly, the provisions of the Victorian Criminal Procedure Act 2009 and the Victorian Evidence Act 2008 will apply to such a trial via the operation of the Judiciary Act 1903 of the Commonwealth. As well, both the Corporations Act 2001 and the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 make provision for a number of indictable offences, all of which involve contravention of federal criminal law. I note with interest that it has been reported this week that the first indictable cartel prosecution under the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 has been launched. Any charges laid under those provisions will, I understand, be heard in the federal court. Given the extraordinary complexity of the relevant cartel provisions, I can only wish my colleagues in that court the very best of luck. All this means that anyone wanting to practice criminal law must have at least a good working knowledge of some 20 or so separate acts of parliament, state and federal. That contrasts starkly with European systems which have managed to set out the entirety of their criminal law and their law of criminal procedure within just one or two tightly drafted codes. Federalism will always pose difficulties, not the least in coping with the overlap between federal and state laws. There exists the possibility for unanticipated constitutional difficulty to arise. But putting that somewhat obscure issue to one side, it is worth asking whether we need so many separate and distinct statutes and codes to govern the operation of our criminal justice system. My answer to that would be an emphatic no. Laws that are unduly prolix. It will come as no surprise to hear me say that I believe that many of our laws are expressed in language that is convoluted and poorly expressed. 
Dealing first with Victorian legislation, it is sobering to note that in 1958, at the time of the last consolidation, the Crimes Act ran for 208 pages. Today it extends to 645 pages. Of course the reach of the criminal law has grown over the years, and that provides a partial explanation for this apparent verbosity. Moreover, as I said earlier, there is little now left of the common law. It follows that Parliament must say more if it is to define and regulate criminal law. Even so, the sheer size of this Act in its present form must invite scrutiny. It was not until 2009 that the Legislature first felt the need to enact a comprehensive statute dealing with criminal procedure. The Criminal Procedure Act is now blown out to 398 pages. Twenty years ago, the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act 1981 managed to deal with the entire body of law relating to illicit drugs in 152 pages. That act now runs to 393 pages. Prior to the enactment of the Sentencing Act 1991, there was no comprehensive statute dealing with sentencing. The act in its original form ran for 120 pages. It now extends to 541 pages. I note that the current edition of Fox and Freiburg runs for 1,073 pages. That is just a few pages short of the 1,200 pages or so that made up the first edition of War and Peace. <laughs> the Confiscation Act 1997, which enables confiscation of tainted property and the proceeds of crime, originally ran for 183 pages. It now extends to 428 pages. The Crimes, Mental Impairment and Unfitness to be Tried Act 1997 originally ran for 88 pages but has now grown to 206 pages. Both the Commonwealth and New South Wales enacted uniform evidence legislation in 1995. At that time, Victoria elected not to follow suit. However, in 2008, Victoria fell into line and the Evidence Act now runs for 221 pages. If, as I think, Victorian statutes are becoming ever more verbose, the position regarding Commonwealth statutes is, if anything, worse. The Crimes Act 1914, when originally enacted, managed to set out the entire body of Commonwealth criminal law as it then stood in 25 pages. By 1998, that act had grown to 331 pages. In its current version, it extends to an astonishing 857 pages. It encompasses part one, capital A, capital A, which is headed Search Information, Gathering, Arrest and Related Powers and covers 58 pages. They then follow a series of extraordinarily detailed provisions which deal primarily with police powers in the context of terrorism offences. When we finally get to Part 1B of the Act, believe it or not, at page 281, we come to the provisions that deal with sentencing of federal offenders. These provisions run for close to 100 pages and are among the most obscure and difficult to follow that the Commonwealth has ever enacted. I shall have more to say about them in due course. The remainder of the Act deals with a series of disparate topics, including, eventually, some of the traditional federal offences, such as those against government and those relating to the administration of justice. This is far from the end of the tale. In 1995, the Commonwealth enacted the Criminal Code Act, to which the Code is a schedule. The first tranche of the code contained 28 pages. That was understandable because it was always intended that the legislation be introduced in stages. In accordance with the methods traditionally used for drafting criminal codes, what might be termed the general part was enacted first. Within a decade, the code had grown to 451 pages and now runs for 887 pages. I do not wish in any way to offend those who doubtlessly laboured conscientiously to draft the code. I must say, however, that I know of no one who has ever had to deal with the Code who has a single kind word to say about it. Finally, and in the same vein, the Commonwealth has enacted its own confiscation legislation. In its original form, the Proceeds of Crime Act 1987 ran for 91 pages. The current version of that Act, the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, runs for 388 pages. This growth in both the number and length of Commonwealth statutes is, of course, by no means confined to the criminal law. In their extremely thorough and helpful text, Professors Pearson and Geddes note that in 1950, the Commonwealth Parliament passed 80 acts, all of them published in just one slim volume of 281 pages. In 2000, 372 Commonwealth acts were passed, published in five volumes, taking up 4,383 pages. It is a sobering thought that the amount of legislation enacted by the Commonwealth each year 
is now so great that I understand that it is no longer produced in hard copy. The figures set out above are depressing. They speak for themselves. Unduly complex and excessively prescriptive laws. The former Chief Justice of Australia, the Honourable Murray Gleeson, when delivering this very oration in 2008 said, and I quote, one of the changes making the work of modern judges different from that of their predecessors is that most of the law to be applied is now found in acts of parliament rather than judge-made principles of common law. A federal judge devotes almost the whole of his or her judicial time to the application of an act of the federal parliament, whether it be about corporations law, or bankruptcy, or family law, or migration." End of quote. His Honour could have made much the same point regarding the work of state judges and their work in the field of criminal law. It is the inescapable duty of the court to endeavour as best it can to ascribe some meaning to every provision within every statute. In that task, the court may be assisted by reference to various canons of construction. However, it is fair to say that for every interpretive principle that can be called in aid, there is likely to be an equal and opposite interpretive principle that suggests a different answer. Of course, the task of interpretation will also be assisted by making assiduous use of the doctrine of precedent. In the course of an address given in 2007, former Chief Justice of New South Wales Spiegelman said this, quote, law is a fashion industry. Over the last two or three decades, the fashion in interpretation has changed from textualism to contextualism. Literal interpretation, a focus on the plain or ordinary meaning of particular words is no longer in vogue. Purpose of interpretation is what we do now in constitutional, statutory and contractual interpretation. There does appear to have been a shift from text to context. Perhaps the former Chief Justice spoke a little too soon. Later pronouncements by the High Court, exemplified by perhaps that court's judgment in Tease and the Collector of Customs, have arguably shifted the balance back towards textualism with just a hint of qualification. In Tease, their Honour said this, and I quote, statutory construction involves attribution of meaning to statutory text. As recently reiterated, this court has stated on many occasions that the task of statutory construction must begin with a consideration of the statutory text, so must the task of statutory construction end. The statutory text must be considered in its context. That context includes legislative history and extrinsic materials. Understanding context has utility if and insofar as it exists in fixing the meaning of the statutory text." End of quote. Some pundits have suggested that modern drafting could be improved by greater use of what is described as plain English. Pierce and Geddes bell that particular cat by referring to the Queen against Roach, where Justice Tagel pithily observed, quote, Plain English alone achieves nothing. To be useful, it must run in tandem with clear thought. End of quote. <laughs> For learned authors go on to refer to Halwood Corporation Limited and the Rhodes Corporation, where Justice Ormiston, referring to plain English drafting, had this to say, quote, I'm not sure that in the right hands the redrafting of statutes and other legal documents could not be of benefit to all. The vice so far of plain English is not so much in the concept as in its execution. It is no use redrafting statutes unless the person responsible for the redrafting has a complete understanding of what it is that has to be achieved. It is difficult enough to amend existing laws, let alone to rephrase and reorganise statutory concepts which have been understood in a particular way over many years. To achieve a satisfactory end, a very deep knowledge of the legal concepts is required in order to achieve simplification of language which does not defeat the objects of the legislature. Moreover, plain English cannot simplify complex concepts, and it is more frequently the need to simplify the concepts that is required rather than the use of modern language. Again, well-instructed minds can achieve that end, but if the concepts are not to be changed, clarity will not always lead to brevity." End of quote. Judges these days often find themselves having to grapple with seemingly intractable problems of interpretation. In many cases, a constructional choice must be made. That choice is not always an easy one. The problems are exacerbated at an appellate level when it is understood that any interpretation accorded to a particular provision may have to be explained to a lay jury by way of jury direction. Regrettably, there have been a number of instances where, by reason of poor drafting, the criminal law has been left in a state of uncertainty. 
I've spoken in the past about some of the provisions that have given rise to particular difficulty. Fortunately, a number of these have recently been repealed. I refer in particular to the abortive attempts in the past in this state to legislate for both statutory self-defence and the elements of rape. Thankfully, we no longer have to concern ourselves with those provisions. There are, however, a number of examples of poor drafting to be found in current statutes that continually give rise to problems. For some reason, many of these are to be found in the Sentencing Act, which I must confess is not my favourite piece of legislation. A recent example is section 44, which was introduced in 2014. That section enables a court when sentencing an offender to make a community correction order in addition to imposing a sentence of imprisonment. However, the section goes on to provide that a court may do so, quote, and listen to this carefully, only if the sum of all the terms of imprisonment to be served, bracket, after deduction of any period of custody that under section 18 is reckoned to be a period of imprisonment or detention already served, close brackets, is two years or less. And that mode of expression illustrates a good deal of what is wrong with modern drafting. Apart from its turgid and obscure language, section 44 has already created a number of problems for trial judges. It has also caused difficulty for the Court of Appeal. The section cannot readily be reconciled with the obligation imposed by section 11 of the same act to fix a non-parole period, save in narrowly defined and usually irrelevant circumstances, in any case in which the total effective sentence is for a term of two years or more. Now, this has led a number of county court judges to sentence in a manner that has been described by the Court of Appeal, perhaps unkindly, as artifice, resulting in a spate of sentences of exactly 23 months duration. The method by which that 23-month period is achieved is often contrary to basic sentencing principle. This is all done so that imprisonment can be combined with a community correction order, which may be a laudable object. However, it involves working backwards from a desired result rather than dealing appropriately with each offence on its merits. Another example of infelicitous drafting resulting not just in complexity but also confusion comes from parts 2A and 2B respectively of the Sentencing Act. These provisions create special sentencing re regimes for what are described as serious offenders and continuing criminal enterprise offenders. With regard to serious offenders, section 6 capital B divides these into four classes. Serious sexual offenders, serious violent offenders, serious drug offenders and serious arson offenders. In order to tell whether a particular offender falls within one or other of these classes, it is first necessary to turn to a schedule to the Act to discover what particular offences can trigger the operation of these provisions. There is then a set of elaborate criteria outlining the factors that are specifically relevant to whether the offender is in fact a serious offender. For example, the Court is required to have regard to a conviction or convictions for a relevant offence, irrespective of whether recorded in the current trial or hearing, or in another trial or hearing, or in different trials or hearings heard at different times, or in separate trials of different charges in the one indictment. Supposedly the point of all this is that section 6 capital E provides that every term of imprisonment imposed by a court on a serious offender for a relative offence must, unless otherwise directed by the court, be served cumulatively on any uncompleted sentence or sentences of imprisonment imposed on that offender, whether before or at the same time as that term. If all this sounds extraordinarily complex, that is because it is. Worse still, experience has shown that these provisions are basically useless. So far as I can tell, section 6E enabling a sentencing judge to impose a disproportionate sentence upon a serious offender has yet to be invoked, despite that section having been introduced some 20 years ago. It should have been obvious to those who came up with the idea for this section that this would be its fate. Sentencing judges have always had ample power to impose appropriate sentences for offences such as rape without having to embark upon the slippery path of disproportionate sentencing. I note that some years ago section 6 capital E was described by the Court of Appeal as draconian. All that saves the section from that epithet today is that it is effectively a dead letter. Much the same can be said of the continuing criminal enterprise provisions contained within part 2b. Theoretically the effect of section 6i within that part is to double the maximum penalty that is available when sentencing an offender who meets the criteria for that description. In practical terms, the section is rarely used in any direct sense. Once again, there is ample scope within orthodox sentencing principles to deal effectively with any major fraudster who has committed a series of offences, each involving more than $50,000. 
A third area where the Sentencing Act has been shown to be ill-considered, in part, as well as badly drafted, lies in what is described as baseline sentencing. As is well known, in 2014, the Victorian Parliament introduced this form of sentencing with the obvious aim of increasing sentences for baseline offences. The entire exercise was always doomed to fail. The case that exposed the fallacy underlying what the legislature had purported to do was DPP against Walters, a pseudonym. It concerned a sentence imposed for incest. The baseline provisions declared Parliament's intention to be that at some unspecified time in the future, a sentence of 10 years imprisonment would become the median sentence for that particular offence. As the majority of the Court of Appeal observed, quote, Parliament has thus expressed its intention using the language of statistics. Median is a statistical term used to identify the middle number in a series of numbers, end of quote. The majority accepted that the legislature's intent could readily be discerned. However, in a landmark judgment, the court held that this intent could not be implemented. That was because the baseline provisions were silent as to how a judge seeking to impose a sentence for incest was to do so, quote, in a manner compatible with, unquote, that stated legislative intention. In effect, there was a gap or defect in the legislative regime, which, according to the majority, was simply incurable. It was not the role of the court to fill that gap or cure that defect. I could spend far more time on the defects associated with the Sentencing Act, but I will spare you my thoughts on that matter. Instead, I will move very briefly to consider two of the problem areas that have always bedeviled aspects of the Evidence Act 2008. These are hearsay and tendency and coincidence. As regards hearsay, section 59 of the Evidence Act relevantly provides, one, evidence of a previous representation made by a person is not admissible to prove the existence of a fact that it can reasonably be supposed that the person intended to assert by the representation. Two, such a fact is in this part referred to as an asserted fact. Two A, for the purposes of determining under subsection one whether it can reasonably be supposed that the person intended to assert a particular fact by the representation, the court may have regard to the circumstances in which the representation was made. Section 60 goes on to state, one, the hearsay rule does not apply to evidence of a previous representation that is admitted because it is relevant for a purpose other than proof of an asserted fact. Two, this section applies whether or not the person who made the representation had personal knowledge of the asserted fact within the meaning of section 62.2. Now, I would question whether provisions drafted in such opaque terms can possibly match for simplicity and clarity of expression the following formulation, quote, evidence of a statement made to a witness by a person who is not himself or herself called as a witness may or may not be hearsay. It is hearsay and inadmissible when the object of the evidence is to establish the truth of what is contained in the statement. It is not hearsay and is admissible when it is proposed to establish by the evidence, not the truth of the statement, but the fact that it was made. Classic statement uh, in Subramaniam's case. Or even better, why could not the hearsay rule be defined for statutory purposes in the terms formulated by Sir Rupert Cross? Definition of hearsay. Assertions of persons other than the witness who is testifying are inadmissible as evidence of the truth of that which was asserted, beginning and end. The problem is that the drafter wishes to encompass within one or two sections of an act a body of learning that developed over many years regarding the scope of the hearsay rule, and in particular whether that rule extends to implied assertions. Two points can be made. First, that question will only arise in the rarest of cases. Secondly, this issue has been largely resolved by the courts. The attempt to compress all the learning on this subject into a statutory definition has led to confusion and on occasion error. It might be thought the cake is not worth the candle. As regards sections 97 and 98 of the Evidence Act 2008, dealing respectively with tendency and coincidence evidence, there is little that I can usefully say at this point. These sections provide constant work for the Court of Appeal and are the bane of many trial judges. They represent the worst features of an act that is otherwise well drafted and has succeeded in putting the law of evidence on a sound conceptual foundation. The relationship of these provisions with section 55, the test for relevance, and section 137, the probative value versus prejudice balancing test, is at best uncertain. The High Court's recent decision in IWM and the Queen has done little to resolve that uncertainty. Moving then to Commonwealth statutes, which continually lead to trouble for both judges and practitioners, the provisions of the Code occupy a starring role. 
Take, for example, the treatment accorded to the term dishonesty in the Code. That term is defined as meaning a dishonest according to the standards of ordinary people and b known by the defendant to be dishonest according to the standards of ordinary people. The criminal lawyers in this audience will immediately recognise this formulation as importing the two-part objective and subjective test for dishonesty adopted by the English Court of Appeal in the Queen against Gosh. That approach is squarely at odds with the wholly objective test adopted by the High Court in Peters against the Queen in relation to the offence of conspiracy to defraud under section 861E of the Crimes Act 1914, as it was. The question then arises as to whether the code definition of dishonesty applies to the term dishonesty in relation to other Commonwealth legislation. That includes, for example, the Corporations Act 2001. Alternatively, is the Peters definition applicable to that act? Issues of that kind are part of the constant struggle to make sense of the code and to apply it in a coherent manner. Another problem that arises under the code is the treatment afforded to drug offences. The legislature in its wisdom has chosen to have gradations of offending in drug cases all linked to the quantity of the drug in question. This leads almost invariably to charges being contested where there is no issue as to the fact of drug dealing but only a dispute as to knowledge of the exact quantity of the drug in question. That is hardly a sensible approach, particularly when there are multiple gradations within the statute. Worse still, this form of drafting, which is widely used throughout the code, unnecessarily complicates trials. There is potential for error in relation to a number of offences, given that different fault elements are applicable to different aspects of the conduct elements of these offences. This renders the task of directing a jury extraordinarily difficult. These comments are particularly applicable to the money laundering provisions under the code. It is almost impossible to understand why we should have six separate gradations of dealing in the proceeds of crime, depending upon the value of the money and other property in question. These range from money or property worth $1 million or more, maximum 25 years imprisonment, 100,000 or more, maximum 20 years imprisonment, 50,000 or more, maximum 15 years imprisonment, 10,000 or more, maximum 10 years imprisonment, $1,000 maximum five years, and any other value maximum 12 months. It is hard to imagine a worse form of drafting for an offence of this kind. As I previously indicated, the matter is made more complex by the fact that different fault elements apply to different components of the offence. Turning from the problems associated with the drafting of the code to the sentencing provisions contained within Part 1B of the Crimes Act, the key provision is Section 16, capital A2. That subsection sets out the various matters to which a sentencing judge must have regard, as well as those to which no regard should be had. For reasons that I have never been quite able to grasp, one factor that was omitted from an otherwise lengthy and seemingly comprehensive list of relevant sentencing considerations contained within section 16A2 was general deterrence. It is astonishing to think that it took the legislature until 2015 to rectify that omission. Consider also section 16A1, which provides as follows, quote, in determining the sentence to be passed or the order to be made in respect of any person for a federal offence, a court must impose a sentence or make an order that is of a severity appropriate in all the circumstances of the offence, unquote. It would be hard to imagine a more absurd provision is it even conceivable that the drafter thought that without section 16 capital A1, judges would regard themselves as being at liberty to impose sentences of a severity which were, to their minds, inappropriate? I will not go on in this vein. There are numerous other examples of recent statutes, particularly at the Commonwealth level, where, to put it kindly, the drafting is less than user-friendly. There are no doubt many and various reasons for this. One important factor, I suspect, is a misplaced concern on the part of some modern drafters, acting no doubt on misguided instructions from some legislators, that there should be a taxonomy of substantive offending, offending which reflects various aggravating factors. Thus, instead of one offence, we have a number, each with its own particular elements and characteristics. It may be thought that drafting in this way has the beneficial effect of leaving it to juries rather than judges to make the particular assessment of the gravity of the offence required. The downside of this, of course, is that the law is rendered more complex. Juries whose roles are already sufficiently onerous are required to embark upon even more difficult tasks. In making these criticisms, I do not wish to be misunderstood. I recognise that drafting is a difficult process. 
it requires considerable skill and experience. Language is an uncertain and imperfect means of communication. Developments in science and technology and other areas mean that legislation will inevitably have to deal with ever more complex issues. Some of these cannot readily be distilled into clear and simple concepts, at least without distorting meaning. I also understand that drafters must ensure that the product of their work is capable of being understood, not just by the most erudite of jurists, but by all sections of the community. They must try as best they can to anticipate as many possible contingencies as can reasonably be foreseen. And they are no doubt aware that there will be a class of reader who will not approach the task of interpreting their work in a sympathetic or even common sense manner. Even making due allowance for these difficulties, however, there is something unsettling about the way in which some modern statutes are drafted. Statutes that create criminal offences in particular must be capable of being readily understood. In addition, judges can surely be credited with some modicum of common sense. They should not be forced to trawl through provisions that in some cases are so obscure as to lead almost to a brain explosion. Sadly, distrust of the judiciary and of its ability to exercise sound judgment lies at the heart of much of the unduly prescriptive drafting that we see. Amended too frequently. For some reason that I cannot fathom, criminal statutes, more than most other acts of parliament, seem constantly to be amended. Some degree of restraint in this area would be a good thing. Bad laws should, of course, be repealed or amended. Whether every anomaly should be instantly corrected is a different matter. It ought to be possible to avoid tinkering with provisions that are in almost daily use and to leave their amendment to a single comprehensive amending act, perhaps introduced no more frequently than twice a year. It is often difficult to tell exactly when a particular amendment came into effect. In criminal matters, in particular, that information is essential. If the amendment concerns matters of substantive law, it needs to have been enforced at the time of the relevant offending. If it is procedural in nature, that may not be the case. One of the most thankless tasks that anyone concerned with the criminal law must regularly undertake is working through what are described as transitional provisions. In an effort to reduce the size of legislation by avoiding the repetition of common provisions, both Victoria and the Commonwealth have enacted provisions that relate to such matters as dates of commencement of acts and the effect upon the law of the repeal of an act, and drafters assume a knowledge of the relevant interpretation act when they prepare legislation. In the period from 1 January 2013 to 30th of June 2016, that's a period of three and a half years, the Victorian Parliament enacted numerous amendment acts, each of them potentially having a significant impact upon the workings of the criminal justice system. The figures are instructive. The Crimes Act was amended by 25 separate amendment acts in that period, Criminal Procedure Act by 25 separate amendments act, Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act by 10, Sentencing Act by 34 separate amendment acts, Confiscation Act by 12 separate amendments act, and I, I could go on. Many of these individual amendment acts contained within them a number of separate amendment provisions. Thus, for example, Division 7 of the Justice Legislation Further Amendment Act 2016 amended three separate sections of the Sentencing Act. On occasion, judges and practitioners failed to pick up the fact that a section that was assumed to be applicable to the matter at hand had in fact been repealed. The Commonwealth is no better in this regard. As far as Commonwealth legislation is concerned, the figures for the same period show that the Crimes Act was amended by 19 separate amendment acts, the Criminal Code by 26 separate amendment acts, even the Proceeds of Crime Act by 10 separate amendments acts. Fewer amendments spaced out over longer periods would enable greater consultation by drafters, in particular with those who are appropriately qualified to comment upon possible unintended consequences. It would also enable greater attention to be given by drafters to the impact of the proposed change upon the coherence of the Act as a whole, as well as its relationship with other cognate statutes. Perhaps our political leaders, and not just our drafters, might do well to reflect upon these thoughts regarding the criminal law. Contrary to the views of some, not everyone in this community is well equipped to comment upon its technical aspects. Criminal law is a vastly complicated body of rules where almost every provision in almost every act is likely to be intertwined to some degree with others. Change one part and you may inadvertently change others. That is true even in relation to sentencing, that most difficult of judicial tasks, where everyone seems to have an opinion, but not always one that is well informed. Consequences of poor drafting. Every time a judge is confronted with a provision in an act that is either poorly drafted 
or requires a lengthy trawl through numerous other sections in order to make sense of what the provision before him or her means, harm is done. If the judge ultimately falls into error and the matter has to be corrected on appeal, the situation is even worse. Figures helpfully provided to me, courtesy of the Office of Public Prosecutions, indicate that between 2005 and 2016 there were 345 successful appeals against conviction, roughly 30 per year. Many of these cases had to be tried again at emotional cost to the parties and witnesses and at financial cost to the community. Of that number, 132 appeals involved findings of misdirection on the part of trial judges. Of course, there would have also been a significant number of successful appeals arising out of evidentiary rulings and a small number arising out of procedural irregularities. It would be interesting to know how many of these successful appeals involved the misinterpretation by trial judges of statutory provisions. My suspicion is the number would be high. The legislature, if it goes about the task properly, is perfectly capable of producing high-quality, well-drafted reform of the criminal law. In 1879, Sir James Fitzjames Stephen wrote the report of the Criminal Code Bill Commission and the draft bill appended there too. In my view, that was an example of the very best of legislative drafting. The draft code was formulated with elegance, clarity and precision. The substantive elements of every serious crime then known to the law contained therein. In addition, it dealt with criminal procedure and with sentencing. Indeed, it foreshadowed the creation of an entire appellate structure in criminal matters hitherto unknown to the criminal law and only ultimately adopted some 30 or so years later. It managed to do all of this in the space of 150 pages. As we know, Stephen's work led to the Draft Criminal Code Indictable Offences Bill of 1879. The bill lapsed in Parliament. It seems there was strong judicial resistance at the time to codification of the criminal law. Stephen, however, had the last laugh. His code was enacted in India and has largely survived intact. It has been adopted to a considerable degree in Canada. It forms the basis for the criminal codes of Queensland and Western Australia. In the United States, the model penal code of 1962 represents another example of what can be done when codification is carried out sensibly. The model code has been adopted by a large number of American states. In England, attempts to codify the criminal law have hit a proverbial brick wall. That is a pity. It leaves the common law, as shaped by the judges, as a primary source of legal doctrine. As far as the common law is concerned, it must be said that, by and large, the House of Lords has not distinguished itself in the field of criminal law. I should say, however, that in their more recent guise, as the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and as the Privy Council on Appeal from Jamaica, their lordships have redeemed their reputation somewhat. I refer to the Queen against Jogi and Ruddock and the Queen, where they reformulated the common law principles of complicity in a manner that ha could hardly be bettered, at the same time ridding the common law of the pernicious doctrine of joint criminal enterprise. It is to be hoped that at some point our High Court will emulate their example. Well, that takes me to Mozart. <laughs> I had thought, when I was asked to present this paper, that I would be the first person ever in this state to invoke Mozart in a speech on an otherwise technical legal topic. I was disappointed to learn that this was not the case. In 2014, Justice Susan Crennan delivered the Victoria Law Foundation oration for that year. Her topic, in what was a splendid paper, was Magna Carta, Common Law Values and the Constitution. She noted that as a composer, Mozart had been prodigiously ambitious. She said, and I quote, a first performance of one of his compositions, written when he was 16, before a royal court elicited the royal criticism that the music contained too many ideas. Given 800 years of history and evolving legal culture in Australia and the United Kingdom, it is impossible not to fear and indeed admit that discussing tonight's topic will involve touching too lightly and too selectively on too many ideas." End of quote. Justice Crennan invoked Mozart by way of what I would describe as anticipatory self-deprecation. Far be it from me to challenge Her Honour's exposition of musical history. The exact details of her account of the Mozart story are, however, questionable. That story first emerged in a biography of Mozart written by Franz Niemicek in 1798. According to the author, the Emperor Joseph II had commissioned the opera, The Abduction from the Seraglio. When he heard it played, he complained to Mozart, quote, that is too fine for my ears, there are too many notes. This was said to have elicited the somewhat impudent reply from Mozart, 
There are just as many notes as there should be. Another more satisfying rendition of the Mozart story can be found in the film Amadeus. Here the emperor is praising Mozart's work, describing the premiere of his opera in Vienna as an excellent effort. The dialogue then proceeds as follows. Mozart, so then you liked it, you really liked it, sire? Emperor, well of course I did, it's very good. Of course now and then, just now and then, it seemed to touch, uh, Mozart, what do you mean, sire? Emperor, well I mean occasionally it seems to have, oh how shall one say, turning to Orsini Rosenberg, how shall one say, director, Orsini Rosenberg, too many notes, your majesty? Emperor, exactly, very well put, too many notes. <laughs> Mozart, I don't understand, there are just as many notes, majesty, as are required, neither more nor less. Emperor, my dear fellow, there are in fact only so many notes the ear can hear in the course of an evening. I think I'm right in saying that, aren't I, court composer? Salieri, yes, yes, on the whole, yes, majesty. Mozart, but this is absurd. Emperor, my dear young man, don't take it too hard. Your work is ingenious. It's quality work. And there are simply too many notes, that's all. Cut a few and it'll be perfect. Mozart, which few did you have in mind, Majesty? <laughs> Reputable scholars have questioned both the too many ideas and too many notes versions of the Mozart story. First, it seems that the translation of the original German from Niemicek's biography is not too many notes, but rather an extraordinary number of notes. The anecdote, which has often been repeated, may have unfairly given the emperor a bad reputation concerning both his own musical abilities and his appreciation and support of Mozart. Indeed, I understand that there is actually a substantial body of scholarly writing defending Emperor Joseph II from such criticisms. The famous complaint, too many notes, is generally perceived to be a gaffe uttered by a blockhead. Yet, as Jan Swafford, an eminent music critic and commentator, pointed out, Whatever it was that the emperor may in fact have said simply echoed what nearly everybody, including Mozart's greatest admirers, believed about him. Mozart was so imaginative that his music was considered at times demonic. It was regarded by many as, quote, overloaded and overstuffed. Although Justice Crennan stole my thunder by referring to the Mozart story in the way that she did, I will unashamedly borrow her use of that story as mitigation for what might fairly be regarded as the light and selective treatment of tonight's topic. But I would add there is more to my invocation of Mozart than this. If his compositions were demonic, so too are a number of the criminal statutes with which we, as the poor consumers of this product, daily have to grapple. If his work was overloaded and overstuffed, that is a perfectly apt description of many of the provisions that feature in legislation of the kind that I've been considering in this paper. If Mozart's work contained too many ideas or too many notes, the same can, same can surely be said, with a slight adaptation from ideas or notes to too many words, much of what our drafters regularly bequeath to us. There has long been a debate as to who first proffered an apology for having written a long letter explaining that if the author only had more time, he would have written a shorter one. That witticism has been attributed at various times to the 17th century mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal, as well as to Benjamin Franklin and even Mark Twain. As an aphorism, it contains an important truth. It is far harder to write succinctly than discursively. It takes more time and effort to do so. In the end, however, those charged with the vital task of turning words into law must understand that sometimes the less they have to say, the better it is said. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Weinberg. A thought-provoking and indeed provocative uh, address. Uh, the question may be, how do we carry it forward? And I'm sure the Chief Justice and the President will be thinking of that. But one could almost hear uh, the silent three cheers going around the room through all the judicial officers here tonight, anyone that's had, and, and anyone in the profession that's had to struggle with a obscure uh, drafting and legislation. Uh, th thank you very much, Mark. That was a terrific address. Uh, now, I would also, while I'm at it, uh, like to thank uh, the Chief Justice for attending and opening the proceeding, and in addition, for kindly uh, agreeing to allow us to have the use of this splendid courtroom here tonight. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a lot of cooperation. That's the Law, Law Foundation with the court, indeed all of the courts, and uh, it's always appropriate to express our appreciation. Thank you. Now, we have until 7.30, uh, because uh, His Honour has moved uh, speedily, uh, in which to have questions and answers. So, uh, because of moving speedily, he is, has a longer period of time in which to be subjected to questions. One thing I have to say is this, though. Uh, please um, uh, make your questions short, uh, because for the purpose of recording, to make sure that it gets onto this, I'm actually going to have to uh, repeat the question. So if it gets more than a few words, and, and it's soft, my voice is, my hearing's not too good, please speak up. So it's now open to questions. Yes. I think the question addresses the uh, Canadian law relating to legislation and informs us that the uh, courts in Canada or the Supreme Court take an active approach in the application of the evidence laws and look beyond the mere technical wording of the thing in the statute to try to give it a practical operation. Is that the effect of your question? And that we don't take that approach in Australia? I think that's the question. Well, we, we do the best that we can, uh, at least at the Court of Appeal level. Um, sometimes we don't always get the result that we want uh, you'll recall, of course, that the Uniform Evidence Act does not apply in every jurisdiction throughout Australia, uh, and so we have a disconformity between, for example, Queensland and some other states that have not introduced it. Uh, it has to be said also that uh, some of the decisions that have come out over the years have not been all that helpful in terms of expounding sound principle. Uh, that uh, there have been disagreements, for example, between the interpretation of some of the provisions of the Uniform Evidence Act in Victoria and in New South Wales, uh, and the High Court from time to time uh, also finds itself divided, and worse still, from time to time produces a judgment which doesn't lead to a, a, a statement of principle that's binding upon anyone. Uh, but for all that, uh, it does seem to me that evidence law is an area that was always ripe for codification. Uh, if ever there was an area where there were large tranches of common law that were out of date and needed to be brought up to date, it was the law of evidence. Uh, and I think the, and I, I should say, I sat on the Law Reform Commission which, uh, as a consultant, which produced the Uniform Evidence Act, so I'm responsible for the good bits and for the bad bits. I'm very sorry about sections 97 and 98. That was a mistake, and I apologise for that. Uh, but uh, on the whole, I think the Evidence Act has worked well. I think it's a good codification, almost complete codification of the law of evidence. Would that we could do as well uh, with some of the other areas that uh, codification has been attempted in relation to. Or in... Thank you. Thank you Matt. Yes. Thank you. The question is, uh, how is it that I'm able to say that the Uniform Evidence Act is essentially a code or codifies the law of evidence when there are provisions in the Act, I think sections 8 and 9, which uh, make the provisions of the Act subject to amendment by other Acts? Well, the answer is it's not a complete code. It doesn't encompass every uh, aspect of the law of evidence. There are uh, large uh, areas that are not dealt with by the Act, for example, presumptions, burden of proof, standard of proof, matters of that kind. But it is a, it's close to being a code, uh, and in parts it is a code. So, for example, uh, sections 97 and 98 uh, leave no room for the uh, older law uh, dealing with uh, striking similarity, common law type tests, and so forth. So uh, your question is properly based. It's correct uh, to uh, uh, qualify what I said. It's, it's an almost code, not quite a complete code. Uh, there are problems with it. Uh, um, for example, uh, I had to deal in a trial that I did in Norfolk Island with whether or not the uh, unsworn statement could still be made in Norfolk Island, and I had to deal with sections 8 and 9 and whether they had uh, uh, allowed the Norfolk Island version of the code to supersede the 1935 Criminal Law Act that applied previously. Uh, I allowed the accused in that case to make the last unsworn statement that I think will ever be delivered in this country. It didn't do him any good. <laughs> but, 
uh, that's, that's about all I can say, that 99% uh, of the law of evidence is in the code. There is that difficult provision, section 8 and 9, uh, and uh, later legislation can and does amend the code. For example, the Jury Directions Act, you'll find, has uh, had the effect of amending a number of provisions that uh, would otherwise be dealt with by the Evidence Act itself. A question up here. Um, your well, the, the question uh, relates to the comment I made about the contrast between uh, our approach to legislation and the way that a number of European countries, the civil law systems, deal with this. Uh, I have some familiarity with the Italian codes. There's a code of criminal procedure and a code of civil, uh, sorry, a code of criminal law and a code of criminal procedure. Uh, they were introduced fairly late in the piece. The Germans have a code of criminal procedure and so forth. They're relatively short documents. Uh, they don't purport to try to cover every single contingency that might arise. And of course, European jurisprudence deals differently with the interpretation of these problems. Uh, the courts don't have a doctrine of precedent of the kind that we have. Their judgments are short. Uh, while I've been criticising drafts persons for uh, unduly long statutes, uh, can I reserve a comment or two for myself and my colleagues? We sometimes perhaps all too often uh, write at excessive length. Uh, and uh, that's something that we all need to be conscious of. If we had more time, we'd write shorter judgments. <laughs> yes. Benyon's work is, is a magnificent work, and uh, nobody should be without it. Uh, as far as interpretation legislation is concerned, the Act Interpretation Act and the Interpretation of Legislation Act in Victoria, some years ago when I was on the Australian Law Reform Commission, I suggested that uh, as a topic for reference, we ought to consider reviewing the Act's Interpretation Act and revising it and making it more comprehensive and perhaps a code. Uh, nobody was terribly interested in that idea. Uh, it can be helpful, but we sometimes forget that that Act exists and can be invoked. There are provisions in the Act, such as singular to the plural and when uh, particular provisions come into force and so forth, that are very, very valuable and uh, they, they tend to spring up at you as a kind of afterthought from time to time. But yes, I agree, it's time we had another look at the Acts Interpretation Act and the Interpretation of Legislation Act to bring them up to date and to make them more comprehensive and more helpful in that regard. Thank you. Any more <coughs> questions? The jury. Peter. Um, um, I think the Sentencing Act could do with some pruning. Uh, I, I can understand why we have a body of law that has been legislatively enacted in relation to sentencing, uh, but I don't think it needs to be 600 or 500 and something pages. I think we could uh, state the principles far more generally and leave it to the uh, good sense and intelligence of judges to go about their task. Uh, it always worries me when I see sentences having to be set aside, not because there's anything wrong with the merits of the decision, but because for some reason a judge has inadvertently failed to comply with some very technical requirements, and the Act is full of these technical requirements and full of traps, uh, traps for the unwary. So uh, yes, as far as the substantive criminal law side of things is concerned, yes, we can produce a properly thought out good code but one thing we mustn't do is have separate uh, fault provisions that apply to different aspects of uh, the uh, offence in question, such that parts of it are absolute liability, parts of it involve knowledge, parts of it involve recklessness, default provisions. All of this is nonsense, and uh, that's not the way one should go about drafting a modern code. I, I'm a great supporter of the work that was done in England by the Law Commission, by uh, Sir John Smith in particular, uh, and others who worked very, very hard to produce a code. In, in the end, there were small bits of code that were produced. It didn't always work out because the courts got hold of these provisions sometimes and didn't interpret them as well as they might have. But uh, uh, on the whole, yes, I, I am a supporter of good legislation. It's, it's a big task, though. It requires uh, advice from those who are participants in the system. We need criminal professionals, the, the judges, the uh, solicitors, the bar, uh, the academics, and uh, really it's, it's 
the task of a, uh, an ongoing uh, body that deals with these matters at considerable length and over a considerable period of time. Much of the great work that was done in England was done not by the Law Commission but by the Criminal Law Revision Committee which produced the Theft Act. Uh, and that had people like Sir Rupert Cross on it and John Smith and others. And these people knew what they were talking about. And in conjunction with and under the auspices of people like Lord Gardner and others who were very keen on codification, they produced some magnificent work. We could do the same. But uh, unfortunately, you don't do that by having ad hoc changes made to a, a, an act like the Commonwealth Criminal Code, uh, where every year or two, uh, a different drafts person comes at it, forgets that when you amend one provision, it has potentially an impact right through the code and other acts, because the code operates across the board in relation to other Commonwealth statutes as well. I couldn't think of a worse way to go about the task of law reform than, than what we have done over the years in, in some respects. We have a perfectly good body, the Australian Law Reform Commission, which does excellent work. And uh, that would be a, a wonderful thing for the Australian Law Reform Commission to take on, revise the code and simplify it and reduce it in length. It doesn't have to be 900 pages long. Uh, so there it is. Yeah. <coughs> Should we have that's an excellent question. I, do I need to repeat it? I'll sum, summarise it. The question is, um, I've been um, criticising, if not insulting, drafters, and perhaps um, I should comment on whether or not they are really to blame for whatever problems we have, and perhaps to some degree the blame ought to be sheeted home to their political masters, uh, the politicians who sometimes uh, fiddle with legislation which has been well drafted and produced something quite different. We've had examples of this. Some of the provisions that dealt with the statutory definition of rape and so forth were the result of uh, uh, good work done by the Victorian Law Reform Commission, but when it came out the other end, after the politicians had got hold of it, it looked quite different in a number of key respects from the way that it was originally drafted. And we've all seen this kind of thing, and the politicians need to understand that Something that sounds like a good idea, an amendment that you throw in, as it were, late in the piece, can have the most profound implications so far as the rest of the statute is concerned. So I happen to believe in democracy. I happen to believe that uh, politicians uh, uh, obviously make the laws and the courts do what they can to enforce the laws, but the politicians themselves need to understand that criminal law is not a plaything. It's a, it's a very important, coherent whole. It's part of our uh, basic values, our rule of law, our system of justice, and it really does require close consultation with people who do know what they're doing. Can I just make that suggestion? Well, again, that, that's a very helpful suggestion. And uh, again, I would simply say that uh, the role of judges is not to get involved in controversial policy issues, except in so far as they feed their way into legislation which then can't work or won't achieve the objects that uh, that, it, that that legislation ought to achieve. And I can see no reason why the judiciary, Chief Justice will blanch perhaps when I say this, the judiciary should not be consulted uh, about the technical aspects of legislation which is on foot. I think we are pretty much in many, many areas so that we can have some input into the, into the process. It doesn't really work all that well across the board. I remember when I was Commonwealth DPP in 1988-89, uh, we were provided with a draft of Part 1B, that's the entire Sentencing Act provisions of the Commonwealth, to go into the Crimes Act 1914. On Friday, we were told that it was going into the Parliament on the Monday and we had the weekend to provide comment. Now, I kid you not, now that was uh, obviously just a, a kind of show so that the legislators could say, well, we've consulted with the Commonwealth DPP. Uh, but uh, I'm talking about real consultation, bearing in mind the different role that the judiciary must always play, which is not to become involved in contentious political questions, but to provide advice as to possibly unintended consequences or possibly uh, improved drafting which would enable trials to proceed more efficiently and also protect jurors from some of the difficulties that can arise when legislation is badly drafted but has still to be explained to, to juries.
Yes. Time for one more question, I think. <coughs> <laughs> Here's trouble. <laughs> this is not necessary, just to say. A comment you asked me office, and I think that's a complaint you hear often. Um, Justice Ashley has uh, raised the question of whether the decline, which he agrees has occurred in the quality of drafting over the past 20 years or so, is not in part due to the fact that uh, the system for giving input and advice to politicians and legislators about the legislation in question uh, no longer has the uh, permanence, if I can put it that way, and expertise of people who used to carry out that role and advice is coming from other sources like political advisers and so forth. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, my own experience with legislation in this state recently was the work that I did on the Jury Directions Act. And one of the things that we insisted on was having a parliamentary council draftsperson attached to our group so that as we considered each and every proposal, we said to her, how would you go about drafting a provision in clear, comprehensible terms that a jury can understand designed to achieve goals A, B and C. So instead of producing a report in narrative form and then sending it off to somewhere where it could vanish into goodness knows what, uh, this wonderful draftsperson uh, sat with us at all stages and, and really clarified what is it exactly that you want to do and will this do the trick? And they can do it. They can do it. Of course they can. The, the, uh, but, but they can do it. The, the quality of drafting is there. The will to go about it in a proper and sensible way, which is a costly and slower exercise, I agree, is not always there. But I, I agree with everything you said, David. Well, thank you very much. I, I think we've just about hit our magic time and the questions are exhausted. I, I think we've been very fortunate tonight in having this very generous and well thought out uh, address uh, by Justice Weinberg and with all the time that he's given. Thank you very much. Thank you.